is David Riley here. I'm very warm welcome to today's edition of People and Politics. Uh, transgender rights have been in the news, you, you, you know, perhaps more than ever before over the last 12 months. And that happened after the Scottish Government passed a law making it easier for people to transition to their preferred gender. Joining me today show is Professor Stephen Whittle. Stephen is Professor of Law at Manchester Metropolitan University and has spent much of his career working on the rights of transgender people. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. So here we go. Welcome to People in Politics. Uh, Stephen Whittle, thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. I'm so grateful for your time. It's a pleasure. Uh, then, uh, Steve, you're Professor of Equalities Law at Manchester Met, at Met, and you spent most of your career uh, working on transgender rights and law, and I thought so we would we'll talk about that uh, today because, you know, in fairly recent times, it's become a real political football. And and so I really wanted to chat about that. But I thought we'd begin, if it's okay with you, by giving a sense of your own story. Because you were born in 55 and transitioned in 1975. That's a very different time and a different... It feels like a different era to what we have now. And I wonder if you'd start by giving us a bit of an insight into that. Well, it is now 50 years ago and it was a very, very different world. Um, trans people were virtually unknown, except in the pages of the Sunday People and the News of the World, where we were called sex change perverts, which was my joke for years was, I don't mind be being called a sex change pervert, but I'm not getting the sex, so I don't know how to be perverted. <laughs> um, but in truth, my start was extremely difficult because you didn't know who to see. You you know, the first psychiatrist I saw said he could treat me, but I had to start living as Stephen before I had any treatment and then live for Stephen as three months, then he'd give me hormone therapy. As it happened, I had a brilliant boss at work who one day stopped me and said, why are you such a mess? You're good at the job, but you, you know, you're late. You sometimes you just don't turn up. What is wrong with you? And I burst into tears and told him the story. And he said, is that it? Wow. And I said, well, yes. And he said, well, we'll sort that out. Take a fortnight's holiday. I'll sort out the university. I was working as a lab technician at Manchester Met. What was, it was called Manchester Poly then. And um, he went round. He instructed all the other lab technicians to practice saying good morning, Stephen, every day. Yeah. You know, um, it wasn't easy on my return to work, but, you know, during those two weeks, he took me out to the pub a couple of times, made sure I was comfortable, um, you know, and met me to take me into work. And so, you know, total support. And as he said afterwards, you know, there were people who thought that I should be just dismissed automatically, but it, it also helped 
that I was in the trade union and the shop steward of the trade union uh, was a gay man who who lived over the road from me at the time. You know, we all lived in a little sort of area which was safe-ish um, with his partner who had his partner worked for Manchester City Council and was very involved eventually in improving the gay village in Manchester, you know, bringing some sort of sense of safety to it. Um, and they were, and they also ran the best gay disco north of <laughs> the South Coast oh. at Manchester Metropolitan University, at Manchester Polytechnic then. Perfect. So it was like a perfect collection together and it made it possible. And I, and I stayed a further two years there to the point where I felt comfortable. But the psychiatrist, I saw his psychologist, who was a very strange man. And then I saw another psychologist because the first psychologist said it was okay. I should go ahead. But he still wasn't sure. So I saw another one. And she literally said 40 minutes into the conversation, I don't know why we're having this conversation. It's absolute waste of time. And I thought she was going to say no. Uh -huh. And she just looked at me and she said, you've done your reading. You've thought long and hard about it. You know exactly the decision you're making and all the risks that are involved. And I have no doubts whatsoever that it would be absolutely the right decision for you. And she wrote the letter in front of me. It took another six months to get to see the bloody psychiatrist again. You know, people, NHS appointments are bad now, you know. Well, if they didn't want to see you, they could make it bad then. Anyway, I walked into his office and he literally had been living and working at Stephen at that point for a year without any treatment. So, you know, it was you know, I was aware that I was very androgynous. Um, but he just said, I will never treat you. You will never live as a man. And then called security to get me removed from the premises. I remember as I left shouting at him, I've just done this for nearly 12 months. What am I meant to say to people that it was a stupid mistake? He said, if needs be. That and I arrived home intending to just end it. You know, I'd given myself a target for 21 to do this because I really did not know how I could progress through my life otherwise. People used to imagine their futures. All I could see was blackness. I couldn't imagine anything in my future. And um, my GP was sat on the doorstep. Wow. And she said, I don't know how to do this. I don't know. You know, you probably know more than me, but I, I like my patients to be alive. Mm -hmm. I'd rather make a mistake, but have somebody alive than do nothing mm. and not see them again. Mm. And um, so we we did it that way. And the joy of that was... That was, apart from one psychiatrist who we had to see at one point, who was completely awful, but we, I only ever had to see, that was when I was having my first surgery, and their surgeons were very concerned as to when they were doing, you know, the right thing ethically, and so they insisted I went to see a guy, and um, I went with my partner, Sarah, who's now my wife, and... Uh, all he could do was talk about whether we'd ever had group sex with people. Well, you know, for Christ's sake, I was 23, she was 18, you know. <laughs> we didn't even know what that concept was at that point in our life, you it's know. Astonishing. astonishing. And, and the whole thing was pretty <laughs> shitty. Yeah. You know, I always say we were, we were the dirt people wiped off their shoes when they went into their houses. So, so after your GP uh, made the decision to treat you, what was the next months and years of your life like then? Well, it was, I mean, initially it was very difficult. Um, 
the hormone treatment worked very quickly. I was still young. So, you know, within a year, I had a beard, deep voice, etc. But, you know, I, I, the first surgeon I ever saw about having chest surgery told me there was a 15-year waiting list. 15 years? Yeah. Now, as it happened, the following year I met Sarah, we became a couple within weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and a year later, when we were living together, um, I had breakthrough bleeding, which meant that went to see, you know, the doctor. I, I was at university at the time and, you know, nobody would look at me. And eventually it was suggested we go to what was then known as the VD clinic. It's now genital, genital urinary medicine, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we trotted off and they were in sort of had semi-hysterics. They didn't know which side of the building to put me on. <laughs> oh, if we put, you go in the men's entrance, the trouble is we don't have this. And we're, you know, Jesus Christ. Anyway, so this wonderful doctor who said, um, you've got real issues I think you may have. You've clearly got erosions of the cervix. I think you may have precancerous cells. I'm going to do a biopsy. But I um, I would recommend an urgent hysterectomy. And I think you're probably not going to be saying you want to have babies. And I said, that's true. Uh, and he just said, and when did you have your chest surgery? And I said, well, I haven't. And, you know, there's a 15-year waiting list. And he burst out laughing. And he said, who told you that? I said, the surgeon. He I said, and why did you believe him? And I said, because he was a doctor. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you believe it? You believe doctors tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, anyway, he arranged my chest surgery. That was a, another story in itself because, you know, I get to the hospital. I've not seen the actual surgeons who are doing my chest. I asked to see them. The ward sister comes in, screams and shouts at people like me. You people! You know, blah, 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 blah. and I say, I'm not going into surgery without signing consent form, and I'm not going to sign a consent form until I've seen somebody who's actually involved. Wow. Anyway, I actually saw the anaesthetist, finally signed the consent form, went down, and 10 hours later was still down in theatre. And so I was waiting, and she said, she had this real, she, she became a nurse, actually, Sarah, but she said she suddenly realised the ward sister who'd been screaming and shouting abuse at me suddenly thought I might have died. <laughs> and there was like this whole change <laughs> of persona. As it happened, um, the surgeons, they had... Three surgeons in there, one on each side of my chest, one doing the hysterectomy. The hysterectomy was done and done very badly. Mm -hmm. That's had, you know, other consequences in life. They didn't, uh, as a gastroenterologist explained to me, he said, you know, in those days they used to lift everything out, put it all aside, take the stuff out, and then chuck it back in. <laughs> he said it's taken us years to teach them how to replace everything. But that's meant that, you know, he said, every female-bodied person I see in my clinic who's over the age of 60 and had a, an early hysterectomy has had a mess. You know, it's not in the right places. It's caused lifelong problems. And because you've got MS in your case, well, that's taken a long time to sort out, you know. But um, And, 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 and I suppose that brings... I thought a little bit to to some of the pro, the protractors and detractors of the day because what what you said is quite powerful and but for anybody who knows what it's like to live a an body that you don't think is your own or is not congregant with 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 your feelings, it's phenomenally difficult, and it's 
Phenomenon. Meant for better unhappy lives. And so you must get frustrated at the at some of the discourse that goes on nowadays. Particularly- Ab- absolutely. Um I mean it we campaigned really from I uh, became involved in support groups right from the beginning because people had supported me. Mm-hmm. And I gave my bit back. Uh, or, and eventually, I mean, I lost, I was sat so often. And I saw this course and it said law, building law. And I was working in the construction industry at the time. And I thought well, maybe I could get a qualification to become a clerk of works or something, something safer where I was the boss, not the bottom. Yeah. Um, and it turned out it was a law degree, and I loved it, absolutely loved it. Wondered why I hadn't had that education at primary school, um, and um, had a couple of very supporting lecturers, and eventually went on to a PhD, and that was how I ended up teaching. But it also made me realise that the only way we could empower ourselves was through the law. Mm -hmm. Because as it was, we had absolutely no rights at all. We could be evicted, we could be refused a service, any employer could dismiss us. And even when with the Sex Discrimination Act came into place, I remember going to the Equal Opportunities Commission and saying, I've just been sacked again. Surely this can't be right. And they said, they can, so long as they say, would say they'd sack somebody who was transitioning from male to female. So, you know, that's equal. So I said, so we're only equal with somebody else going the other way. That makes us the absolute bottom of the pile. It means we have no protection in the workplace whatsoever or anything. And they say, well, yes, that is sort of, yes, that's the situation. Just was... (laughs) And I met Mark Rees at that point. He was, he he took the first case to the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah. So I... I I realised, I met Mark Rees, who was outed by the Guardian newspaper. He took the first case to the European Court of Human Rights under the name of Nicholas Winterton. And then I was, I knew this case was going, but didn't know who it was. And then I read the Guardian newspaper and it said, Winterton versus Mark Rees. And I'm thinking, ah, right, let's oh. find this person. And found him. And we became lifelong friends. Um, and talking to Mark, you know, you realise the absolute necessity of doing, if we wanted to have any rights at all, it had to be through the law. Yeah. And that to do that, we needed to think about some sort of campaign, really showing the normality, the ordinary of our lives Mm. that you know you may not like the way we look or sound but you know we're just trying to pay mortgages or pay rent pay gas bills and but the thing that we also learned about the trans community one of the things about being trans is you learn to be incredibly tolerant yeah yeah. Of the rest of the world. You know, who am I to judge anybody? Wow. You know, if you've been the very bottom of the pile, you know, I I even people I truly think I, I can't imagine how you can make those decisions, be like that, whatever. I acknowledge a humanity underneath them. Wow. Well, yeah. And that must be it. Enrich your life as it would enrich it would enrich all of our lives if I did that. Absolutely. And you know, it's so many parts of life that you know, I think judgments are made 
about people. And we have laws which make judgments, but what I don't understand is we have systems that make judgments. We don't need to make them about people. We can have a generosity of spirit yeah. that gives other people a space in which to maybe pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and realize that they could be human as well. And so what has happened in recent years to me has been almost beyond my comprehension because it is a, a form of failure to recognize our humanity mm. and a willingness to make us a political football for no reason whatsoever except personal gain. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I con constantly say, you know, the failure of legal aid funding, which has meant now that we have, you know, people crowdfunding for justice, has been one of the worst things that ever happened for justice. Yeah. You know, we need to be able to have a system whereby people can access justice in an affordable way or be supported to do that. Instead, what we have is a justice system which has become a beauty contest. Yeah. Where depending upon how much money you can raise from your supporters depends on how much you can go slam after somebody else. So, you know, some of the more recent cases, um, Alison Bailey, who's a barrister, raised over £400,000 from gender-critical feminists and organisations or whatever, um, to sue Stonewall and Garden Court Chambers, her employers. She ended up receiving £2,000 damages from Garden Court, so roughly that, and £20,000 in a sort of cost agreement. Yeah. And um, um, since there are crossovers, with the disability community because obviously I'm really interested in disability employment rights and law. And again, so much of the law where it's so away and so ineffective. And it's ineffective. And that's borne out just by the economic rates. Amongst the disabled community, either you know, either disabled people are from nowhere, a lazy bunch, or there's another problem, and and there is another problem, and that's a, that's a law. Well, yeah. I, I would think, as somebody who has got, I was I was born with very bad rickets, so I've got a twisted spine. Oh. I have multiple sclerosis, which has nothing to do with hormone therapy, believe it or not. That's how it was once. It's you know, it was just one of the look of the draw, that one. Yeah. And you know, I have a I would say nobody was ever born in the wrong body. Well, except Tom Cruise, who got mine by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't expect to be a tall person. You know, short will do. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. My aspirations were always way beyond my body. Yeah. That's very but good. the problem is that when we, when for many disabled people, when you need to pursue your rights, you are shattered at that point. You've already just been through one hell of a shitty process. You've just, you know, experience discrimination that's been gross. You're probably not feeling very well. You know, you've been exhausted by the procedure and you're meant to struggle through the legal system yeah. at that point. And for many, many people who I speak to, they, they are just, and I've done it myself. I have stood there and gone, no, I can't fight this. I really cannot fight it. It's going to Takes so much 
out of me to fight this that quite frankly I'd rather just give it up yeah. at this point uh-huh. and I see that is what you know there is no allowance made for the impact of disability mm-hmm. on access to justice there's no recognition of the fact that people who are disabled or have a disability don't necessarily have the capacity of other people to be able to multitask in the same way. You are often, you know, it's a struggle to feed yourself, to clothe yourself, to pay the bills. You haven't got any energy left. And then your care comes in and wants to put you to bed. <laughs> I, 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 no consideration is given to those complexities. Uh, you know, I, I, and my, my wife has just um, been dealing with, you know, a comparatively minor issue, a ruptured disc that put her in bed for six months. Um, it was a really bad rupture. And the options were we waited for the NHS which could mean she could spend up to two years being bedridden. And at the age of 63, would she ever walk again after that? Mm. You know, or be able to walk in the way that she was and be fit and doing her allotment and all those things? Or do we hand over the money? Which is, you know, I don't agree with private medicine one little bit, but when it comes to your wife, I'll pay. No, I've had, I've had... I've had so many people say that was him. They don't have people. Yeah. I have a mess and I have two sounds of stuff. But it's your family, your wife, your children. It's just called, it's just called reality. In fact, you know, as a disabled person, I feel like sometimes I feel that other people, they have no conception of the energy that it takes me just going about my everyday life, you know, and just oh. to live my life on the same basis. It's exhausting, and people will never, ever, understand. ever comprehend that. No, it, it, it's just not. It's just not. In you that. and I will have this conversation, and we'll stop, and you and I will be shattered by this evening. Is that right? Yeah. And, you know, I know Sarah will come back from London later today and she'll be chatting away and at some point she'll say, so? And I'll go, huh? And she'll say, are you listening? I say, I'm listening. Well, you haven't said anything. I haven't got a moment's breath left right. for no. talking. You won't just don't understand. And she is incredibly understanding. Yeah. And she will at that point go, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. You know, Wednesday's your working day, so, you know. Oh. Um, I mean, I'm semi-retired now, but I always work on Wednesdays. And, and she'll suddenly remember and she'll, you know, back off. But it's that sort of thing of, you know, just run out and run out. Yeah. I know exactly what I'm feeling, and it's most debilitating. <laughs> it's really debilitating. People who have not experienced that just will never comprehend. Uh, one thing that I didn't want to ask you before, uh, you know, my sort of wrap up, you know, is you know, you did so much work to change the law and you, you know, you've got the Gender Recognition Act to come under the Equality Act. And, and, you know, the Gender Campaign was making good progress. But but do you ever feel, well, you must, uh, that, that that good work is being un- unpicked? And re- oh, um, yeah, it's being and, unpicked. And we're going back the way. And... How do you think that will play out in the future? It's very hard. Um, it's being unpicked. Every now and then somebody will say to me, well, well, the problem is it's all these 
non-binary people and all these kids wanting to do this. And I say it's nothing to do with that. Those things are all to do with the fact that finally we do have rights and people feel able to have the conversations and they have parents who are more understanding. And, you know, that's all to do with that. What's happening at the moment is entirely to do, I'm afraid, with, and I'll put it in large terms, the religious right. There are many people who have got onto that bandwagon who would say, well, I'm not religious, I'm not on the right. Well, hold on a minute, but you're making a living out of this. Or you're being naive and haven't done your background homework, because if you did, I said, you know, there's a, a fabulous uh, podcast um Oh, God, I wish I could remember the name of it, but on transphobic hate, um, done by an American firm. Um, and it's 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 very easy to look up. Just look up transgender hate and you'll get, get it. And it's a series which actually literally unpits the people behind the campaigns, the money sources and where it comes from. Wow. And it's from the States or from the Catholic Church, who, you know, Catholic Church started its anti-gender campaigning way back in the 60s when the anti-abortion laws were being considered. You know, the abortion uh, or the abortion rights laws were being considered. Here, you know, the the abortion law in 1966, um, Rome Wade in the States and things like that. They, there was an analysis done just two years ago that showed that in the UK alone, there'd been, by this point, 2019, three million pounds spent on anti-transgender rights campaigns. Wow. By That's the, a huge amount of money. By it's, um, well, where does that money come from? The church? Oh, organisations like the Heritage Foundation in the States, which started out as an anti-abortion uh, mm. organization. You know, and I say to people, you know, this is not about us. This is about the rights of those people who I think want to lead a tolerant, welcoming, you know, acknowledging of change, but improving the world, you know, thinking about their grandchildren and their great grandchildren, rather than just about them. It's about that group of people being, you know, suddenly, um, and and I would, how to explain? In two thousand and four, I remember, or was it two thousand two thousand two when we won the case at European Court of Human Rights, appearing on Newsnight in a rather drunken state, <laughs> and they had this um member from, I think it was the Evangelical Alliance, this vicar who used to come and speak. And Jeremy Paxson was uh, saying, you know, he's pointed to me and then to this vicar. So are you saying that this bearded man can only marry a man, you know, and think, and finally I said, look, let's face it, it's been a long, hard campaign. We won. You lost. Just accept it. Well, I don't think they ever accepted it. And when Theresa, I met Theresa May in 2014 at a Downing Street garden party to, to celebrate the Same Sex Marriage Act going through. Wow. And she said, she asked me about the transgender issues. And I said, well, on the whole, we've got the law in place, but the discrimination is still rampant. And how do we deal with that? And we, it was a five-minute conversation, and a, a year later, I got this message that the first inquiry for the, the, the newly formed Women's Inequalities House of Commons Committee was going to look at transgender rights. It was brilliant. It made recommendations. Theresa May said, I'm going to follow through on those recommendations, one of which was to reform the Gender Recognition Act to make it less intrusive 
I mean, the, the restrictions that were put in place in 2005, that you had to have a psychiatric diagnosis, that you had to wait two years, were put in place at that time because it was political expediency. We needed to find a way to stop using the world reporters, getting gender you know, recognition certificates and then saying, see, look what anybody can do, <laughs> things like that. We needed something to stop that. That was the two years. And the psychiatric diagnosis was really, we said, look, you cannot force people into having major surgery. It is unethical. And furthermore, there are people in our community who would die if they got on the opposite operating table. There are people, you know, I know people who have disabilities or chronic illnesses that they literally cannot have genital reconstruction surgery. I said, if you're going to insist on those things, the whole swathe of people that are going to be left out. And we've always said, nobody's going to be left behind. Mm. You know, we won't, you know, we'll give in to some things, but and that's how we ended up. So she said, right, we'll reform the act, we'll do it, follow through the recommendations. And at that point, the opportunity came for the right to pump its money in to a new campaign. And what we also saw aligned with that was, in my personal opinion, a group of older feminist writers who were no longer the fashion of the day, were no longer getting the jobs to write for the various newspapers, and they saw an opportunity. Uh, mm. And they jumped on it, and, you know, one of them I've known many years, and she says, look, I, you know, I write for a living. I'm a journalist. I have to do what I'm asked to do. And I go, no, you don't. You know, I've known you for years. You know, how does this tally with this? You know, I've I've always worked by making friends, not by making enemies. You don't get anywhere by making enemies. No. You know, and I also believe in and of myself that kindness and tolerance is at the core of a decent life. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to get rid of somebody. And actually it's really important sometimes to listen to the other side. But... For her, you know, she's writing stuff I know she doesn't really believe. Because if she did, how could she ever be my friend? Yeah, that's right. Of course. Yeah. It won't happen. But... So those combination of factors have left us with her horrendous mess. But I keep saying to the youngsters, stay strong, you know, be resilient, learn your rights, learn the law, do some reading, stop looking at your phone screens, read a book occasionally. Yeah. You know, it'd be really helpful. Um, you, you know, you'd, two screens on a phone gives you nothing of a story. Yeah. You know, you got to get behind it. <clears throat> and you know what? There is an arc to history. Yeah. Well, good. Make sure you're on the right side of it. And that's very wise advice. Very wise advice. It is. Uh, uh, Stephen, it's been a real pleasure talking to you this morning. I've thoroughly, I've thoroughly enjoyed our discussion. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, Absolutely. No problem. Yes. A joy to meet you, David. Uh, you too. Thank you. It's a pleasure.